All right. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. And you know, folks who are trickling in, we'll, you know, we'll catch them up. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Sullivan. I'm the chair of the Access to Affordable Care Impact Area here at Doctors for America. Um, before we get started with today's session, I uh, just want to take a quick second um, to encourage everyone who is not already um, a member of Doctors for America to officially join. Um, taking that important step uh, will both help in, uh, encourage programming like what you're seeing here tonight um, and then help us take bigger steps to grow our organization and our reach throughout the country. Um, and so by paying your annual membership dues, um, you'll be contributing to DFA's long-term sustainability. Um, and so there are six different levels to choose from. Um, one of our uh, staff members is going to be dropping a link in the chat um, for those of you who are interested in joining. And, um, and don't don't fear, there will be a recording of this session um, available on the Doctors for America YouTube channel um, after the session. Um, so we're just going to go over a quick few ground rules here. Um, and so uh, all questions are encouraged, uh, and those questions can be dropped in the Q&A function. Um, so I know some people might be more familiar with the chat feature in Zoom, but um, for webinar setting like this, uh, dropping in the Q&A, which you can find there at the bottom, uh, you may just have to go into the, the more uh, settings um, there along your bottom uh, control panel, um, and then you can drop questions in there. We'll be able to see them and flag them for Larry. Um, and uh, those questions we'll be getting to in the second half of the presentation after uh, Larry goes through some of the uh, stuff you'd like to like us all to know. Um, and then just keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, just like with the link to join as a member, um, our staff members here will be dropping some helpful links throughout the session for anything else that's relevant. All right, so now with uh, all the boilerplate out of the way, um, we'll get on to tonight's speaker. Um, so we're extremely excited to welcome Larry Levitt uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, so I, I have here a, a very impressive bio that I'm going to uh, read here, so hopefully won't embarrass Larry too much. Uh, but Larry is the Executive Vice President for Health Policy, overseeing KFF's policy work on Medicare, Medicaid, and the healthcare marketplace, as well as the Affordable Care Act, racial equity, women's health, and global health. Um, he previously was editor-in-chief of KaiserNetwork.org, which was KFF's online health policy news and information service, and directed KFF's communications. Levitt, along with uh, Dr. Molly Ann Brody, work with KFF's founding president and CEO, Dr. Drew Altman, to oversee the organization. Prior to joining KFF, uh, Levitt served as the senior health and policy advisor at the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services, working on the development of the Clinton administration's Health Security Act, um, and other health policy initiatives. Earlier, he was also the special assistant for health policy with California Insurance Commissioner John Garamendi, uh, a medical economist with Kaiser Permanente, and served in a number of positions in the Massachusetts state government. <clears throat> Levitt holds a bachelor's degree in economics from University of California, Berkeley, and a master's degree in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And with that out of the way, I will now pass it on to Larry for tonight's session. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think I have to shorten my biography after listening to listening to that. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, what I wanted to do, uh, and I, I uh, look forward to your your questions and the and the discussion. Uh, what I wanted to do is go through uh, ten things uh, that I'm watching in in health policy uh, over the over the next year. Uh, and for those of you who know me, know I could probably do fifty things, um, but uh, certainly want to leave time for for discussion. So so limited it to ten. Um, you know, number one uh, has to be the the election, which is uh, now in in full swing. Um, and honestly, I fully expected this to be the first presidential election in quite some time where healthcare reform and the Affordable Care Act were not going to be front and center uh, as contentious issues. Uh, but as we've seen over the last few weeks, uh, Trump may may change that, vowing on multiple occasions. Uh, to try to repeal and replace the ACA uh, once again, if elected. Um, you know, I expect President Biden to primarily run on his record on health care, and uh, he has, in fact, fulfilled, I would say, his major promises uh, on health care, reinvigorating the ACA, uh, reversing many Trump actions, and uh, achieving, uh, giving the government authority to negotiate drug, drug prices. Um, I would expect President Biden to likely to, to push further uh, for further action on, on drug prices, uh, extending uh, 
government negotiation to the private sector in addition to Medicare, uh, and then possibly uh, revisiting uh, unfulfilled promises uh, from, from his first campaign, which was to create a public option under the Affordable Care Act and, and lower the age for Medicare eligibility. Um, you know, regardless of how the Affordable Care Act or these health reform issues play, um, health care, particularly in abort abortion rights, uh, will certainly be an important issue uh, after the Supreme Court's overturning of, of Roe v. Wade. Um, could be especially important in some swing states and districts, um, for example, Arizona, uh, which will likely have a ballot initiative um, guaranteeing the, the right to abortion. Um, I would say abortion, you know, aside from being a contentious issue in, in the campaign, which it certainly will be, um, could be particularly important uh, for for turnout, um, you know, who, who shows up to vote. Um, and of course, even if these health issues aren't debated or weren't debated, uh, elections always have consequences uh, for the budget, for Medicaid, uh, for example, Republicans nationally have been pushing work requirements requirements in Medicaid, uh, for access to family planning, uh, and of course, for appointing judges, uh, as we saw under uh, the Trump administration. Um, so as I said, abortion rights will certainly be a central issue uh, in the campaign, um, uh, and the election has has consequences. Uh, you know, Trump, I think, could likely do much more administratively to restrict abortion access, frankly, than, than Biden could do uh, to promote it. Uh, there's no question we'll see continued state actions to both restrict and protect uh, abortion access. Uh, and importantly, we will see a Supreme Court case uh, this spring on uh, the FDA's approval of, uh, of mifepristone, of medication uh, abortion, uh, which, is, which now um, accounts for about half of abortions uh, nationwide. Um, Talked about the Affordable Care Act. I think no question the future of the Affordable Care Act will continue to be an issue. Uh, just yesterday, the Biden administration announced uh, record enrollment over 21 million people, uh, which is up 5 million from, from last year. A big part of that was the uh, enhancement of premium subsidies, uh, first under the American Rescue Plan and then extended under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, those temporary subsidies, which have made coverage uh, substantially more affordable, uh, which was the biggest knock uh, on the ACA historically, uh, expire at the end of 2025. Um, so whoever is the next president will no doubt be instrumental in determining uh, whether those subsidies get extended or, or not. Um, at the same time that we have seen historic enrollment in the Affordable Care Act, uh, we are seeing millions of people being dropped from Medicaid as the continuous enrollment protection that existed during the public health emergency uh, is unwound. Uh, during the public health emergency, states were uh, prohibited from disenrolling, from dropping anyone in exchange for uh, additional federal funding. Uh, and as a result, Medicaid grew by 23 million people uh, over the course of the, the public health emergency. Uh, that requirement is now being unwound, uh, and our tracking so far shows that 15 million people uh, have been dropped. Uh, and I would say significantly, and maybe the most important number in all of this, is that 71% of the people who have been dropped from Medicaid uh, have done have been dropped for uh, what are called procedural reasons. So these are people getting caught up in red tape, not being able to complete the enrollment process, and may very well still be eligible for, for Medicaid. Um, many of the people being dropped are getting coverage through the marketplace, um, and that is part of what has uh, led to the, uh, the record enrollment th this year. Um, many are getting employer coverage as well, but definitely not all, uh, and some are certainly end ending up uninsured. Um, also in Medicaid, some activity on, on expansion. Uh, North Carolina became the latest state to expand Medicaid uh, un, under the ACA. Uh, that leaves now 10 remaining states, primarily in the South, uh, that have chosen not to expand, uh, with about 2 million people being caught in the, the, the Medicaid coverage gap. These are people who are not eligible for Medicaid, do not have incomes uh, above the poverty level, so are not eligible for the Affordable Care Act marketplace and are caught in a, a gap where they have access to no affordable coverage at all. Uh, number five, uh, I mentioned uh, drug, drug prices uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, which gave the government authority to negotiate drug prices in Medicare for the first time. Uh, the government has been prohibited from 
negotiating drug prices uh, since the creation of Medicare Part D, uh, the retail uh, drug benefit in, in the program. Uh, and I think significantly this uh, uh, not only will address drug prices, but is a potential foot in the door for a larger government role in restri restraining healthcare prices generally. Um, it is a modest first step, uh, even in, even within the drug sector. Uh, it starts off with 10 drugs uh, initially growing over time. There are lengthy exclusivity periods where drugs are not subject to negotiation. It does not apply outside of Medicare, um, but it is an important first step. Uh, and even those 10 initial drugs uh, represent a substantial portion of Medicare spending. Um, the first prices, uh, negotiated prices will be announced uh, in September. Um, there are not surprisingly uh, many ongoing lawsuits uh, challenging the government's uh, authority to, to negotiate prices uh, and an ongoing debate about innovation, uh, the extent to which negotiated prices uh, could, could harm drug innovation. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office uh, estimated that out of an expected 1,300 drugs to be approved over the next three decades, uh, that 13 fewer drugs would come to market as a result of uh, the drug pricing provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and we don't know what those 13 drugs are. Uh, you know, would they be Me Too drugs? Would they be important innovations uh, to, to people's health? Um, you know, importantly, and this has gotten less attention, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act also included measures to uh, cap uh, insulin copays in Medicare at $35 a month, and even more significantly, uh, cap out-of-pocket drugs overall uh, in Medicare for the first time, and that cap is starting to take effect this year. Um, affects uh, you know relatively modest number of people, but for those people with very high drug costs, uh, it can be thousands of dollars in, in savings per year. Um, the, the other issue I think uh, is is bubbling up, I think as, as physicians, you would probably say more than bubbling up, uh, is, is prior authorization and, and claims denials by, by insurers. Um, this has become increasingly controversial and, and increasingly a burden uh, for, for patients and, and providers. Um, our analysis shows that in Medicare, uh, there are about 35 million requests prior authorization prior authorization requests in Medicare Advantage, um, not in traditional Medicare, which was generally does not use prior authorization. Uh, Two million of those requests uh, are denied uh, and about only 11% of the denials uh, are, are appealed. Um, you know, we've seen some hospitals leaving or threatening to leave Medicare Advantage uh, over the effects of prior authorization. Uh, and I think a significant backlash uh, is coming reminiscent of the uh, backlash against managed care generally in, in the 1990s. Um, there were just released regulations in the last, uh, last couple of weeks to streamline the process uh, in public insurance programs, uh, setting some time limits on prior authorization decisions, uh, but that only goes so far. Um, also been recent controversies over insurers using computer algorithms for prior authorization. Uh, which could potentially help the administrative burden, but I think raises thorny issues and threatens trust in the system. Uh, number seven, I would point to uh, telehealth, uh, which is not a new issue, but, uh, but continues to be an issue. Uh, some analysis we did with uh, Epic Medical Records data uh, showed that the use of telehealth during the pandemic uh, peaked at about 11% of outpatient visits, uh, but importantly, 40% uh, of visits for mental health and substance use. Uh, it's fallen off generally uh, quite substantially, but, but not for mental health, in, in fact. Um, and I think telehealth has the potential to change how mental health care is delivered uh, on, a, on a significant and permanent basis. Um, I, I would say looking at mental health generally um, also continues to be a, a, a serious issue with, uh, with, with greater public attention. Uh, we recently did a poll uh, with CNN that found that 90% of the public believes the, the nation has a mental health crisis. Uh, and I would say that's certainly true, but it's stunning for 90% of the public to agree on, on anything these days. Um, and honestly, policymakers have not quite caught up with the public. 
uh, on this. Uh, you know, the whole bunch of issues um, that are are challenging and and still go largely unaddressed. Uh, stigma associated with mental health, um, lack of providers, certainly uh, the narrowness of insurance networks uh, where we have technically mental health parity, but but not in practice. Uh, and all of this results in high out-of-pocket costs uh, and, and care delayed or, um, or foregone. Uh, for number nine, I would point to, uh, to price transparency. Uh, you know, Trump, when he was president, did a lot to undermine healthcare programs, uh, and Biden has reversed uh, much of what Trump uh, did do. Uh, but interestingly, one thing that was uh, lasting and, and with bipartisan support uh, was requiring hospitals to disclose uh, their prices uh, and not just their charges, um, but their negotiated prices with, with every insurance plan. Um, <clears throat> this kind of transparency is, in healthcare has always seemed like a no-brainer in theory, uh, but it's honestly not clear what the effect will be in, in practice. Uh, and with uh, you know market the market power of hospitals, uh, one can even imagine a scenario where this could lead to uh, to, to higher prices. Um, also, the data, while it's great to have it available, is frankly uh, a mess. Uh, you know, mostly a reflection of how complex hospital billing is. Uh, but when you actually dig into the data and try to compare prices uh, across hospitals in a region or across plans for a given hospital, um, it's, it's really very hard to do given, uh, given the differences in, in, um, in, in co contract reimbursement approaches uh, across plans and, and hospitals. Um, there's currently an, an effort to uh, potentially codify hospital price transparency uh, in law uh, through an act of Congress. Um, that may happen, or if it's going to happen, uh, it would be in the next month or so as part of a, a spending bill to, to keep the government open. Um, that may come along with greater scrutiny and regulation of, of phar pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, but honestly, as dysfunctional as Congress is, the best bet, uh, as always, is, is to bet on nothing happening uh, in, in Washington. Uh, and finally, number 10, uh, certainly an evergreen issue, but a big one is uh, trends in the healthcare uh, marketplace and, and what's that, what that means for costs and affordability uh, and patients. Um, and over time, we have seen tremendous uh, hospital consolidation. Uh, more recently, we've seen private equity uh, buying up um, uh, all parts of the healthcare system, including physician practices. Um, all of this results in an arms race with insurers uh, who have also consolidated uh, significantly. Um, there has been, under the Biden administration, growing antitrust and regulatory scrutiny uh, of the healthcare sector. Uh, but, you know, in many ways, the cat is already out of the bag, uh, unless you're going to break up uh, big hospital systems or, or big insurers like we did with the telephone companies. Um, uh, you know, it's very hard to, to turn back the clock. Uh, you can stop one merger or or another merger, uh, but that's not going to make a big difference in the overall consolidation of the industry. Uh, and frankly, the, the most effective approach may be um, to focus on anti-competitive practices of an already consolidated uh, industry. Um, I, I also expect a growing scrutiny of nonprofit hospitals, uh, uh, quote unquote nonprofit hospitals, since nonprofit hospitals do make profit. Um, we estimate that, that the nonprofit hospital sector uh, gets about $28 billion a year uh, in tax exemptions um, and uh, don't always, certainly don't provide sufficient charity care uh, to make up for that tax exemption. Uh, but in many ways, uh, policymakers are questioning how much community benefit they, they provide uh, generally. Um, I think as part of that, there's a big focus on uh, the bill collection practices uh, of hospitals. Uh, we estimate that there are 100 million uh, Americans uh, with healthcare debt of come, some kind. Most of them are insured, uh, so their debt is is from large co-insurance, co-pays, and deductibles uh, totaling almost $200 billion uh, a year. Uh, there's been some progress on that, for example, around protecting people's uh, credit reports, uh, but that doesn't erase the debt that, that people are actually uh, incurring. 
Um, and that gets at, uh, and I'll, I'll end here, um, gets at what I think is the fundamental challenge in healthcare, which is, a, which is affordability. Uh, we've made tremendous progress uh, with the ACA getting people uh, insured and, and uh, have brought the uninsured rate uh, in the country down to the lowest level ever, uh, but we still have over 20 million people uh, uninsured. Uh, and even among those who are insured, uh, the costs are often just, just too high. Um, whether it's the premiums people uh, have to pay in employer-based insurance uh, or the high deductibles they, they face. Um, you know, the average deductible is now $1,700 per person uh, in employer-sponsored insurance. Um, and the underlying cost is, is, just, is just so high. I mean, many of us don't see it uh, because our employers pay a big portion of it, uh, but the family premium is now $24,000 dollars a year on average, uh, which is enough to buy a new car uh, and buy a new car every single year. Um, so, you know, while we've made a lot of progress, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was a very impressively efficient <laughs> run through, uh, through a lot of major issues there. Um, so friendly reminder to our participants or, our, um, the attendees, um, that uh, you can drop any of your questions in the Q&A box there at the bottom. Um, and we are gonna start fielding those now. So, you know, have, have at it, get everything you want in there and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so our first question here, um, we'd like you to kind of uh, wax on the problem of under insurance, um, which has, I think, kind of connecting with your last point about, you know, even with the expansion of, um, insure, insured Americans, uh, the issue of under insurance is now um, something that is being talked about almost as much. Um, just interested if you want to expand on that at all. Yeah, so I, I um, uh, a few thoughts. One is I, I, I don't think we have a good definition of under insurance, frankly. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal, but we are not good at measuring it. Um, there are various measures like the percent of income people have to pay on out-of-pocket costs, or there have been measures trying to like add the deductible and the premium uh, that, that people face. Uh, but part of the, 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 the issue we have in, 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 uh, in getting a handle on this is that most people, fortunately, are pretty healthy uh, in, in any given year. It's a small percentage of the population that accounts for a large percentage uh, of healthcare costs. So in any given year, uh, you know, a relatively small percentage of the population is going to face uh, unaffordable uh, healthcare costs or be technically under, underinsured in that year. Uh, but the reality is a much larger group of people um, are, um, are, are in fact undersure, underinsured because if they did face a major uh, health issue, uh, they, they would not have adequate insurance to, to cover it. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the problem of underinsurance encompasses several things. One is money. Um, so, you know, facing a high deductible, which particularly for a lower modest income people, you know, maybe may feel close to having no insurance at all. Um, it's, it's high, uh, coinsurance, um, which we've seen increasingly, for example, uh, on drugs, uh, particularly specialty drugs, um, where people are paying a very high percentage of very expensive, uh, dr drug prices. Um, you know, and, and it's, you know, some of what I talked about, about prior authorization and, and, and claims denials, um, that you, you, you have this insurance, but if the care that, that you and your, your doctor feel you need, um, is not being authorized, uh, by your insurer, uh, that is under insurance, uh, as, as well. Um, so, so definitely a big problem. And, and, and I think, um, you know, gets gets less attention than, I mean, it's very easy to measure the, the number of people uninsured and to show the progress we've made there. Much harder uh, to measure under insurance and, and to show any progress. Um, all the solutions are also hard. I mean, um, you know, for example, uh, the Medicare for All plans uh, proposed by uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders and others uh, would have eliminated cost sharing entirely. Uh, that certainly would have addressed the problem uh, of un uninsurance. Uh, as a more incremental step, it's hard to think of ways to do that. For example, you know, the government could cap deductibles and say, okay, deductibles are going to be no more than X, um, but all that will do is raise premiums. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a hard problem to solve incrementally. 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I think I uh, would agree with that. And I think just one one other thing I'd, I'd add from the physician side of things, um, and I'm sure many of our physicians on the call here is, is the degree to which this is impacting the, the patient physician relationship and, and the recommendations that are being made. Um, I know, like just speaking for myself, um, you know, I, I have patients who face high deductibles and, you know, they'll ask me, you know, well, you know, how, how worth it is it to get this test because it's going to cost me X. Um, you know, and that's not something we often get taught in medical school. Um, you're actually often explicitly taught not to consider cost and to just do, you know, what's right, uh, for the medicine. But, uh, that's, that's easier said when you're a med student than when you're facing a person looking at, as you said, like sometimes four or five figure deductibles. Um, so yeah, would agree. Very thorny issue. Um, so our next question, um, is about, uh, what the question asker describes as the alarmingly high rates of maternal mortality in young black women. Um, she would, was wondering if you could address um, what could be done about this national emergency um, and that the, there may have been some attempts in the past with the momnibus legislation um, that was intended to improve the maternal survival of women of color. Um, so interested in your thoughts on that general issue. Yeah, no, it's, um, uh, you know, a, a, a disturbing, uh, problem, uh, certainly. Um, and, and I, you know, I think the Momnibus, uh, you know, certainly included measures that, 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 uh, uh, that would help, um, things like extending, uh, postpartum, uh, uh, care help helps as well, certainly with mortality, um, after birth. Um, the, um, uh, you, you know, it gets at just much, much harder uh, issues to 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 solve. Um, you know, we we recently did a survey of um, uh, of people of color uh, and racism about racism uh, generally and spe specifically in in healthcare. Um, and for example, we we found that uh, you know many people of color. Uh, brace themselves uh, before uh, going going to a doctor visit. You know, pay attention to how they're they're dressing, um, so that they don't face uh, uh, discrimination. Um, you know, th those issues are very very hard to get at, uh, but but we have to get at them. Um, you, you know, it it's um, it, it is those more frankly in some cases more subtle uh, uh, discrimination. Um, and, and racism um, that, you know, that ultimately affect the kind of care uh, people get. Yeah, absolutely. That another, another one with uh, a lot of, a lot of very serious issues and uh, unclear solutions. Um, so a, a question that I'm glad someone else asked, because it was on my list to, to ask if we can, uh, couldn't fill the time, but um, asking you to kind of look into your crystal ball and prognosticate on the odds that the um, ACA uh, enhanced subsidies will be extended or made permanent under the various, you know, possibilities, the various permutations of power um, coming out of November from, you know, Democrats control all three, um, you know, White House, Senate, um, House representatives um, from all the way to the other side. Um, and, you know, certainly can pick any combination of of those therein that you think would be uh, interesting to know, but certainly on the extremes there, kind of curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, so it, it, it's, um, uh, you know, I think if Democrats controlled the White House and 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 both houses of Congress, it's it's very likely that the uh, the enhanced premium subsidies would, would get extended. Um, but uh, e even there, uh, there are the cost issues, um, and, and frankly, the flip side of um, uh, of uh, uh, the record enrollment is that there are more people getting these subsidies, and the cost of extending them uh, is is higher uh, than was originally expected. Um, you know, I think the scenarios are you know, a very short extension of you know a year or so to to buy time. You know, a more modest extension of let's say three years or so, uh, or a permanent extension, which I think would be the preference of of most most Democrats. Um, you know, the, the the subsidies will be expiring at the same time as uh, substantial tax cuts are are expiring as well. Um, so, in a situation where uh, you know Republicans control Congress and the White House, or there's mixed mixed control. Um, uh, and and frankly, even if Democrats 
uh, control, but don't have you know enough votes to um, uh, to let's say get it passed themselves. Um, there's likely to be some kind of I, I think there's a likelihood of some kind of deal around the enhanced subsidies uh, and uh, extension of of the tax cuts, uh, and probably has as has been the norm in in Washington lately, doing so without necessarily paying for it uh, entirely uh, with higher taxes or or spending reductions. Uh, Pay for us. Um, you know, I, I think the the uh, uh, it will be important to uh, help people understand what the effects of not extending the subsidies are. I mean, even for Republicans who don't necessarily support uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, there are now you know over twenty million people uh, in the ACA marketplace, the vast majority of whom would face a substantial premium increase uh, if the subsidies expired. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at where the biggest growth. Uh, in uh, ACA marketplace enrollment has been. It, it has been in red states, uh, and in many cases, red states that have not expanded uh, Medicaid. I mean, in Florida, you know, I think roughly a quarter of the population of the non-elderly population is now enrolled in the ACA marketplace. You have substantial shares in North Carolina and Georgia, uh, in Texas. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, Republicans may not support the ACA, but they are also ne necessarily gonna wanna get blamed uh, for a big, big premium increase by their constituents. Yeah, definitely seems like a case of, um, you know, whoever is left holding the bag at the end when people are scrambling to afford their sky high premiums will, will not be in a, a good position. So yeah, interested to see what'll happen in either scenario or the many, many various scenarios. Um, so we have a couple of questions, um, relating to the same topic, which is, of the holdout states for Medicare, Medicaid expansion, um, what is it going to take to convince those state governments um, to get to expansion? Um, we and you know had someone specifically interested in Florida, which is obviously one of the biggest remaining holdout states along with Texas. Um, but kind of speaking more generally as well. Yeah. So um, the so the answer I would have always given uh, is it would take pressure from the hospital industry. Um, uh, you know, you would like to think that poor people uh, needing coverage would would convince states to expand. That's probably not the case. Uh, but uh, but the hospital hospital industry has a big stake in this, uh, including in particular rural hospitals. Um, you know, rural hospitals and expansion states have done a whole lot better financially than rural hospitals uh, in, in non-expansion states. Um, Honestly, we, we have not seen the lobbying from the hospital industry uh, to the extent that I would would have expected. Um, although it has uh, it has happened and it is starting to to ramp up in in some states. Um, I, I do there there was a, a pandemic era incentive passed uh, by Democrats that um, I, I I dismissed at the time, but I think is having a, a bigger effect than than I expected, which is a an additional fiscal incentive uh, for for states to expand. Uh, it enhances, increases the the match rate on Medicaid uh, for a couple of years uh, if if states expand. Uh, and the result is in, in that in all these states, these non expansion states, if they chose to expand, um, they would in fact make money uh, for for two years. They they would get uh, it, the expansion would not only be free. Uh, it would bring money uh, in, into the state's coffers. Uh, you know, even aside from the kind of broader issue of uh, expansion bringing an enormous amount of federal money uh, in, into a state. Um, you know, and that, that was, uh, I would say, instrumental in North Carolina. Uh, you know, it's kind of already peaking interest in, in even in Mississippi, uh, Georgia, uh, potentially Kansas. So, you know, Possibly even Florida. Um, it's uh, uh, so it, it it it's it's kind of just enough to be attractive, uh, you know, make it that much more attractive uh, for a state, particularly in a in a period now where we are starting to see uh, state revenues declining uh, as the pandemic aid expires, the volatility of the stock market, um, uh, kind of decline of venture capital and startups. Um, so I think I think that fiscal incentive is is even more attractive to to states. Uh, I'm not super optimistic that we're going to see, you know, any any new states expanding this year, maybe even the following year, but uh, um, but but maybe may see some movement soon. Great. Well, I know we here at DFA are certainly holding our 
um, crossing our fingers and hoping to play our part in getting that across the finish line in a lot of places. Um, so uh, another question um, from the audience is uh, getting your thoughts on kind of consolidation in the healthcare industry more broadly, uh, not just within the insurance market, which we've seen, but um, also now with, you know, kind of vertical integration with PBMs and um, other pharmacies, um, and then, you know, also including into provider practices as well. Yeah, no, it's, um, uh, you know, we, we, Kind of had decades of of consolidation, but but it really had, the the nature of it ha has changed. I mean, so um, uh, you know we have seen uh, you know PBMs essentially be consolidated with with insurers uh, and and be one of the same uh, in some cases with pharmacies um, as well uh, with with CVS um, kind of really rapid increase in, in vertical in, integration uh, and health plans, uh, buying up medical practices, uh, particularly United. I mean, the, the, the scale of that is, uh, it is, is quite, quite stunning. Um, and, uh, you know, it almost, it, I mean, in many states, there is technically still a ban on corporate practice of medicine, but, you know, not even clear what that means uh, any, anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, private equity um, a, as well, um, uh, purchasing and and uh, rolling up or or consolidating um, uh, companies, um, which, which is, you know, in some ways the most um, troubling, uh, just given how private equity operates and the incentives um, that that they operate under. Um, you know, for quick profits, um, you know, being willing to cut um, cut cut labor. Dramatically, um, you know where this all ends up. I, I have no idea. I mean, I, I am not optimistic that that, as I said, that we can we can turn back the clock and unconsolidate uh, these consolidated companies. So I think it really has to turn to uh, to the anti-competitive uh, practices. Um, you know, the the activities of PBMs, the anti-competitive practices, the uh, uh, practices of hospitals, you know, with all or nothing contracts, uh, you know, made uh, uh, Secretary Basato when he was attorney general in California, uh, made some progress on that uh, against Sutter, um, Sutter hospitals. Um, uh, but it's, you know, the, the healthcare system looks very different. And, and I would say it, it, it it's not only consolidation, it's really corporatization uh, of healthcare. I mean, it just, it looks dramatically different than it did a couple of decades ago. And I know you alluded to this a little bit um, in your answer just there, um, but someone else had asked about private equity specifically, um, wondering if there's any evidence so far of its effects, positive or negative, um, you know, and, and kind of like getting into the fact that, you know, for the physicians practices in particular that are getting bought out, um, you know, they're potentially seeing a big payday, uh, but maybe not necessarily looking to the future and, and kind of what the, you know, the cost cutting efficiencies will look like. Um, so just interested if you had anything else you wanted to say on that topic. Yeah, no, I, I would say, um, uh, you know, some evidence, for example, uh, in, in long term care uh, in the nursing home sector, um, you know, with, with with physician practices that the evidence I've seen is 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 weak so far um, that, that it makes a difference. Uh, in quality, which I, I don't think means that that is, in fact, what happens. Uh, but uh, but we we have not been good at, uh, and the data is hard to get. But we have not been good at. Um, I mean, frankly, we're terrible at measuring quality anyway, to begin with. But uh, you know, I I just think the, the evidence have not has not been um, uh, uh, hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, yeah, that's fair. Um. All right, so um, keeping in the same uh, kind of general topic, um, DFA, is, as you may know, is is kind of interested in talking more about greed in healthcare more broadly, you know, the the kind of rampant profiteering that I think you're alluding to with the corporatization of medicine. Um, and again, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but, you know, what do you see as the way forward um, to kind of combat that aspect of the American healthcare system? Yeah, you know, it, it is, um, I mean, I think a lot of it is shining a uh, shining a light 
uh, on it. Uh, and we at KFF do that, you know, in our in our research and also in our journalism uh, through through KFF Health News, our our Bill of the Month uh, uh, series. Um, and and I think it's important in all of that to point to. I mean, it's easy to point to anecdotes, uh, you know, of someone getting an outrageous bill and you know, battling a hospital or um, an insurance company. Um, but important to, I think, uh, translate those into, into systemic, uh, sy systemic problems um, and translate it into to policy. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, not everyone will agree with me, but, um, you know, I don't think we're going to eliminate profit in, in, uh, in, in healthcare. Um, uh, so the question is, what what are what are the policy solutions uh, to 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 address some of these issues? You know, is it uh, is it caps on prices? Is it um, you know some cap on profits similar to to the medical loss ratio uh, caps ap applied to to insurers? Uh, there's a lot of focus on CEO salaries. CEO salaries are certainly not uh, you know a small percentage of our of our cost problem. Uh, but where there are incentives in CEO contracts uh, that encourage, uh, you know, profiteering behavior, um, that that certainly uh, is an issue. So, uh, so I, I think it's important to kind of th think about, uh, you know, what 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 are the policy solutions here, short of just you know wanting to eliminate profit in healthcare. Um, and uh, somewhat in a similar vein, uh, we have a question about. Uh, you know, kind of seemingly unstoppable rise of healthcare costs um, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, what are your thoughts on ways that we can be sustainably decreasing overall healthcare spending um, in the years ahead? Yeah, no, it's uh, you know I've I've been at this a, a long time, and uh, you know, you I mean, you can go back decades and decades to to where you know people pointed to. Unsustainable healthcare cost growth, and you know, my God, what if healthcare, you know, becomes twelve percent of of GDP? You know, the world will end, and we certainly blew past that uh, quite quite substantially. Um, I, I think, um, first of all, I think people focus a lot. You know, it's it's the sort of slow boiling frog problem, right? I mean, it it gets worse and worse over time. Healthcare costs grow faster and faster. Than inflation and than workers' wages, um, uh, but it's a it's a little bit at a at a time, um, and I think what galvanizes uh, and and gets people to to pay attention is our our big year to year increases, uh, and I think we may see some of that um, over the next couple of years. We we saw a big jump in employer insurance premiums uh, uh, last year, um, signs that that may happen uh, again. Um, so reports from, you know, some insurers recently in their earnings statements that they're seeing pretty big jumps in, in, uh, in claims expenses. Um, so I think if we saw some, some, you know, a couple of few years running of, of big increases, it would galvanize, uh, attention. Um, question is then what to do about it. Um, you know, I think the Inflation Reduction Act and, and government negotiating a Government government negotiation drug prices is definitely a foot in the door. I mean, it is a it is an unprecedented, uh, momentous step. Um, I don't have a lot of faith that Washington is going to do a lot here, um, but there is movement in states. Um, you know, a number of states are now looking at uh, uh, caps on overall spending, uh, affordability boards. Um, you know, even a, a very red state like Indiana. Uh, kind of brought the business community to the table, um, and is introducing uh, you know some potential caps on on hospital prices. Um, so you know I I think I think it'll I think the progress will happen at the the state level, um, and I think the progress will come by focusing on the extremes and the outliers. Uh, and it kind of gets back to that discussion of of uh, you know uh, prof profiteering in, in healthcare. Uh, that I think you, the more you can focus on, you know, outlier prices uh, by by hospitals or drug companies uh, or private equity owned physician practices for that matter, um, uh, that just defy logic, um, and then construct policy solutions that start to at least address those outliers that that kind of everyone can agree 
um, uh, are unjustified. You know, there's some potential for progress. Um, and I <clears throat> just want to be sensitive to time. We probably have room for maybe two, two or three more questions, uh, depending on where, where the answers take us. Um, so I got one that kind of ties back to um, point number one on your list, going back to the election. Um, and wanting to you know, elaborate further on what you see as the health policy agenda for Republicans in 2024 um, and why the, I think, probably the question asker alluding to here, the, the absence of an agenda isn't a bigger topic for discussion right now. Um, yeah, I mean, so, uh, well, a few thoughts. One is, you know, Republicans rarely have a, a, a healthcare agenda. Or at least a, a proactive healthcare agenda. Uh, you know, historically, voters have trusted Democrats more on on healthcare. Uh, Republicans would much rather talk about uh, you, you know inflation, immigration, crime um, uh, than than to talk about healthcare. Uh, the one time that Republicans, well, the two times, frankly, Republicans have been successful in healthcare uh, was number one opposing the Clinton Health Security Act uh, and taking back uh, Congress, uh, and then opposing the ACA or, or Obamacare, and again, taking back, back Congress. Um, uh, but, you know, as a proactive agenda, um, Republicans have generally shied away from it. Um, the, uh, you know, and, and I think honestly, Democrats face a bit of a challenge uh, right now uh, as well. Um, you know, Trump's talk comments uh, vowing to once again, try to repeal and replace the ACA. Uh, is a bit of a gift uh, to Democrats because I think Democrats were looking ahead at a, at a campaign um, uh, where, aside from abortion, uh, which I'll talk about, where um, uh, you know they were going to run on their record uh, of reinvigorating the ACA, passing government negotiation of drug prices, thirty-five dollar cap on insulin copays. Um, but I, I don't think Democrats. I don't think there's consensus among Democrats about what the next steps are. Uh, in in healthcare, you know what what the positive uh, agenda is. Uh, you know we saw in the last presidential campaign, you know a big debate among Democrats over uh, single payer, Medicare for all, and and more incremental steps. Um, you know current president is certainly not going to campaign on on Medicare for all. Um, uh, but I you know even beyond that, I just don't think Democrats are are together on on what those what those next steps are. Uh, you know, abortion is very different. I think, you know, Democrats are very clearly behind uh, uh, abortion access. Um, Republicans, you know, m for the most part, would rather not talk about it right now because they know the public uh, is also uh, largely in favor of, uh, of access to, to abortion. Um, uh, but, but even Democrats there, you know, the, the, um, uh, I think it's a potent issue. I think it could drive turnout. Um, but it, it is not clear what, even if Democrats, you know, control both houses of Congress and, and the White House, exactly what they can do, given uh, what the Supreme Court uh, ha has done. Um, you know, there will be a move to try to codify Roe v. Wade, uh, but that would take 60 votes in the Senate and, and, you know, very unlikely the Democrats would have that. Great. <clears throat> well, I think we'll get one, one last question in here. Uh, so feel, feel free to give your, your, uh, just your quick answer if, if you want, it's up, it's up to you. Um, but uh, <clears throat> last question here is on Medicare Advantage. Um, and so the question is asking if you see any connection between Medicare Advantage being attacked on all sides recently, both um, around prior authorization, which you mentioned, um, uh, frequent denials of, of services, um, and then the kind of recent overtaking of fee-for-service Medicare and total enrollment by Medicare Advantage, um, and kind of interested in your thoughts on where you see that um, kind of debate and discussion going forward. Yeah, so I, I think what, you know, one thing we've seen recently is, uh, is uh, healthcare providers, particularly hospitals, um, uh, starting to attack uh, or be concerned about, about Medicare Advantage. Um, and, and it's not about the prices because you know, the prices Medicare Advantage plans pay are virtually identical as the prices uh, traditional Medicare pays, you know, essentially by design. Um, 
the uh, it's re it's really about claims denials and and prior authorization. Um, so you know it's it's it, it's something we we I, I haven't seen before, which is providers being concerned about the the growth of of Medicare Advantage. Um, policymakers, you know, you're starting to see a little bit of uh, concern uh, as well uh, around prior auth and and claims denials, uh, but also around you know just the amount of money. Uh, I mean, MedPAC. Uh, the Congressional uh, uh, Advisory Committee for uh, for Medicare um, recently came out with new estimates that uh, that enrollment in Medicare Advantage, on average, costs the government 23% more uh, for a similar beneficiary as traditional Medicare. Um, so it's kind of no wonder that Medicare Advantage has grown so much because we have very effectively bribed beneficiaries uh, into uh, enrolling in these plans. I mean, what's not to like about, you know, one plan that covers your drugs, you don't have to buy Medigap supplemental coverage, uh, a lot of your cost sharing uh, is covered, you get extra benefits, you get gym membership, um, and all for zero premium. I mean, it's, it's, it's like too good to be true. Um, plus, you have brokers uh, getting very generous commissions for signing people up in Medicare Advantage, so they're pushing it uh, as well. Um, uh, but you know, when you've got a, a Medicare trust fund, a hospital trust fund that that uh, will become insolvent, uh, and you're paying more money for people to enroll in Medicare Advantage than in traditional Medicare, you know, at some point that has to become uh, a target. Um, for uh, uh, for for Congress looking to save money, um, and in fact, it really kind of scrambles how Congress uh, approaches uh, trying to achieve savings in Medicare. I mean, historically, it was really about um, you know cutting hospital uh, uh, reimbursement and cutting physician reimbursement. Uh, and right now, we have physicians on the Hill trying to avoid uh, the the latest cut. Um, you know, when you've got and over when you've got most people in Medicare Advantage, that that formula doesn't doesn't work for for Medicare savings anymore. Um, but you have policymakers in a bind, right? Because you've got all these people in Medicare Advantage plans, you know, very generally very happy with them because of the zero premiums and the extra benefits. If you try to cut federal reimbursement uh, to those Medicare Advantage plans, um, you know, you will see some of those extra benefits get cut. You might see premiums. Uh, charged for the plans, and constituents are are not going to be uh, not going to be happy. Um, you know, and I, I think you have the added challenge of uh, the more and more enrollment shifts to Medicare Advantage. Uh, you know, how do you tether uh, reimbursement rates? How do you tether payment rates to traditional Medicare, which becomes a shrinking uh, uh, portion of, of of the system? So um, it, it's and then. Finally, I would say combine that with the fact um, that these plans are enormously profitable for, for insurers. Um, I mean, for example, you've got Humana, uh, you know, one of the largest insurers in the country, which is now almost entirely dependent on, on Medicare Advantage uh, for its business is, and has, in fact, um, given up uh, commercial uh, insurance uh, as a market. Um, you know, the, the, the only growth uh, for most of these private insurers have come from Medicare and Medicaid uh, in, in recent years. Um, so, you know, you've got a sector very, very dependent on this market and, and you could bet that they will lobby heavily to avoid any, any cuts in, in federal payments. All right. Well, sounds like there will be stuff to talk about in 2025 then. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for getting in so many questions and, and thoughtful answers. Um, so we'll you know get get to our wrap up here. Um, so just want to thank uh, both you, Larry, for coming out tonight and, and giving a, a really thought provoking conversation and, and answers to the queries here, and also to our participants for giving such good questions. Um, that I think really fostered a great discussion here tonight. Um, and again, remind anyone for anyone who kind of missed question here or there, the the recording will be available very shortly on the Doctors for America YouTube page. Um, and so just a few other reminders um, before we um, say goodnight. Um, just wanted to thank everyone on the call for what they do on behalf of patients. Um, that's both for health providers and then everyone else in, you know, the broader healthcare space. Uh, even if you're, you know, uh, just someone in the community, um, you know, you're a key, key component of <clears throat> keeping everyone healthy. Um, 
and we're adopt we adopters for America are hoping to represent um, your views um, and hopefully bring patient centered um, policies forward um, in the months and years ahead. Um, we have many social media outlets um, that we are involved in. Um, so Doctors of America can be found on Twitter, um, not, go, not going by X over here, um, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, you can stay up to date with all of our events, our programs, ways to get engaged across those various platforms. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, another plug, please, if you can, uh, if you're interested, uh, join as a formal member. Um, dues can be down to um, very low levels, whatever you can afford um, helps us provide this sort of programming. Um, and then finally, um, if you are a DFA member, you are eligible to receive CME credits for tonight's, tonight's talk. Um, so the link for that will be dropping here in the chat very shortly. So thank you all again. Uh, thanks to Larry Levitt for coming out. Thanks to everyone for showing up and, and listening and participating. Um, and we can't wait to see you for our next event. All right. So everyone have a good night. Thanks so much.